So our scripture reading uh, this morning is from Luke. One of my favorite stories, the calling of the disciples. And you can see that it's in your bulletin if you'd like to read along. So once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, maybe he had a full sanctuary. He saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. He saw his escape. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. So he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and he taught the crowds from the boat. How many of you get claustrophobic? When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Put out into the deep water and let your nets down for a catch. But Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, <laughs> they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. They ran out of parking spots. <laughs> so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. I'm not worthy of all this. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they'd taken, and so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. But Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. Do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. May God add understanding to our words of scripture. If you would, please pray with me to hear a good word from my words and from the reflections of your hearts. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of all of our hearts, may they give you joy, O oh God. You who strengthen us day by day and you who lead us day by day, if only we would let you to more and more abundance. Amen. Well, if you were about to turn 300 years old, how would you celebrate? <laughs> would you throw a party? Would you dance in the streets? Would you stay at home and share a cake with only your nearest and dearest friends and family and leave the really big party to 350? Now, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard for me to imagine 300 years of life. My grandmother made it to 98, and I can still remember her stories about uh, the stock market crash of 29. She, she remembered it vividly. But 300 years, that's amazing, right? <coughs> that's biblical in proportion. <laughs> but a 300th birthday is in fact what we could celebrate if we wanted to, because this Friday, the day after Valentine's Day, February 15th, in the year of our Lord, 2019, is our church's 300th birthday. And I have to say, as I look at us, as I look around, I think we make 300 look good. <laughs> it was, in fact, 300 years ago that a group of people in East Lyme who wanted to, who wanted to go to church closer to home, they were traveling nine miles. Everyone say, nine miles? Nine miles. <laughs> It was 300 years ago on Friday that they wanted to, they didn't want to travel nine miles anymore. It, it, I also learned in my research that in those days, um, you could make about six miles in an hour. That was a pretty good clip. So nine miles was a big deal. 
They called their first minister, Reverend George Griswold. So this week I've been digging through historical documents, reading old sermons from the 1700s, and let me just say, I think I let you off easy. <laughs> my sermons are like footnotes compared to those sermons. My goodness, they're so long. And so because this is the Sunday that we set aside in our church year to celebrate our heritage, I've been doing my best to learn what our heritage is, since I'm so new, and maybe what it means. Because this week, we turn 300 years old. So like anyone, this 300-year-old has experienced some highs and some lows. Can you believe that? <laughs> some highs and lows? And just like anyone, I noticed in our history that the highs and the lows tend to, come to, tend to follow each other. In 1719, the Congregationalists in these parts, to whom I'm related, were tired of traveling nine miles to the nearest church. And you have to understand in those days that church was everything. It was everything. It was your spiritual community. It was your social network. It included your neighbors, your family, your friends, maybe even your enemies. And so a group started something here and they got their first minister to stay for his entire career. Is that amazing or what? <laughs> they converted some of the native people here. Everyone say, yikes, yikes. And they experienced this great upsurge in membership because of the Great Awakening. And then, you know, the first minister died after so many years, and some folks left to form a Baptist church because they didn't want to pay taxes anymore. <laughs> Can you understand that? And so for a few years, for a few years, two elderly women kept the church afloat. Can you believe that? I can. I can. They found funds to repair the meeting house. They found a pastor for the summer months. And then the Methodist church came along and on and on it goes. Now, some years, this church was scraping by, blown by the winds of time, and sometimes literally by winds. I think in, the, in what, 1938, a hurricane blew down the roof of the Congregationalist Church. And some years, this church was booming surging with new people who had come to work in the granite industry, is that right, or the boat yards. This church has been a fire too, burning bright with energy to spare, and this church has been a glowing ember, flying on wings and more than a few prayers. When you have lived a rich and full life for 300 years, you've seen some things. Amen? You've seen a lot of life. You've seen highs and lows, triumphs, disasters. But no church exists, survives, and even thrives for 300 years without one quality. One quality. Now, you're 300, year old, 300 years old, so you have lots of patience. I'm going to wait to tell you what that one quality is. So when Jesus was standing by the lake at Gennesaret with the crowd pressing in on him, waiting to hear whatever words were coming out of his mouth, I wonder if he was overwhelmed. Sometimes I wonder if Jesus was an introvert. What do you think? Yeah, he might have been. He went away to pray by himself quite a bit, especially when all these people were coming towards him. So maybe he was overwhelmed. He wanted a break from the eager expectations of the crowds and the jostling. And what do you know? There in front of him are two empty boats. The fishermen were out mending their nets, and Jesus saw an opportunity. He's kind of brazen sometimes. <laughs> he just jumped into this boat that he didn't know belonged to who. So he jumped into Simon's boat and then apparently asked him to row out further into the lake away from the shore. And Peter did it. Peter did it. I don't know why he did it, but Peter did. And then Peter did the next thing that Jesus asked him to do. He rode out into this deep water, the very water, the spots that they had no luck in before. My grandfather was a fisherman and was highly superstitious, right? They, about different weather patterns and everything. I mean, this is a whole thing, right? So Peter knows there's no, there's no fish here in this spot, no fish, but he did it anyway. He put down his nets. He had no hope it would work, but he did it anyway. 
And then what happened? All of a sudden, there's all this fish. So many fish coming from every direction, practically springing onto the boat. Can you imagine this? So many fish so fast that the nets began to stretch and then tear and then break. Peter is terrified. And who can blame him? Would you be scared as your boat started to sink? There's a lot to be afraid of. And then Jesus said something that changed his life forever. Now, which kinds of words change your life forever? I love you. Does that change your life? It can. She's gone now. That can change your life. You're going to be a parent. Does that change your life? Jesus says to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching people. It isn't just the highs and the lows of faith that bring churches together, that make them survive and thrive. It's that one word. It's faith. Can you say that with me? Faith. And it's a specific kind of faith when you make it to your 300th birthday. It's faith that there might be a beginning inside of an end that there might be a beginning inside of an end. So let me tell you in all my research, the moment in your 300 years that I found the most inspiring. It was at a low moment. It was in the 1930s, where a bunch of people having low moments in the 1930s. Say that with me, you bet, you bet. So the Methodist Church and the Congregationalist Church were both struggling with dwindling membership, with funds, no one was doing well. Their very survival was at stake. And they could have closed their doors. They could have closed their doors. That's what lots of churches did then. It's what churches still do. do. And that can be a faithful response to. But maybe with age comes wisdom. Because those two churches decided that their fate belonged to each other. The Methodist with the Congregationalists. The Congregationalists with the Methodists. So together they would become one church, right? So each sold its building. They talked only for 10 years. Say with me, only 10 years. (laughs) This is a church, remember? (laughs) It's, It's 10 years it takes, right? To see how this marriage would work out. And then you know what they did? They built this building and they built this sanctuary. And if you would, please look at the ceiling. What does the ceiling resemble to you? It's a boat. It's a boat, right? It's a boat. You see, in 300 years, you learn a few things. You learn that there will be highs and lows, triumphs and disasters. But you also know that when you're in deep water, that Jesus might ask you to put your net down. Even though you have no hope, you do it anyway, because there might be a beginning in your ending. There might be a beginning in your ending, There might be more fish swimming around than you realize, and then you've got to prepare yourself. (laughs) You've got to prepare yourself because we might run out of parking spots, right? It might happen, right? Abundance isn't just like cake and candles, right? It can create challenges of its own. But get yourself a bigger boat because God is more faithful than we realize. So I want to say happy birthday to you, church. Happy 300 years. 300 years. I have to say, you make it look good. And someone, I'm going to step aside. I know everyone won't be able to see this, but um, there's a birthday cake on the, uh, on the altar. Uh, who made that? Who made that? Audrey made it for me. If you want to, can you stand up and wave? It's a beautiful birthday cake. All right, there she is. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know what? This just came out of nowhere. Came out of nowhere for our 300th birthday. Amen? Amen? So you've seen a lot in your lifetime, but I have to say, church, I think the best is yet to come. Amen. Amen.